welcome to another um, lecture for introduction of cultural anthropology. Today we're going to keep discussing fieldwork, but we're going to be uh, focusing on, on, on something else, on the morality and the objectivity. So when we read the definition of the ethnographic method, right, you can read this, right, and I want you to, everything seems fine, right, except at the end when we're talking about the native's point of view, right, because as we've already discussed, this is something that is not attainable, right, you can never have a native's point of view, you can understand a little bit and, and, and have a better understanding that a regular person who's not from that community um, has, but this idea that you can gain a full understanding of the, 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 the native's point of view, that's not, that's not real, right? And it's not uh, based on, it, on anything uh, real. So, there, um, there's a, a, a film that I, I uploaded, the, the, the link that you should watch is, is really interesting, and it's talking about these two, two, two different people who went and did research in the same place, more or less, at different times um, with different perspectives, right? And it's really, and if you watch it, you, you, you should, like I said, it really shows how subjective anthropology is in the sense that we see what we see in the field is really shaped by who we are and what we're looking for, right? Um, and this idea that when you go to the field you're a blank slate, so in the past people would say you don't, you, you, sometimes it's even better that you don't know anything about that place, right? Because you'll be a blank slate and you won't be influenced by anything. But the fact is that we're already influenced by our own culture, by our gender, our race, our ethnicity, our class, backgrounds, our experiences um, shape what we see and what we don't see. And this happens when you watch a movie, right? You can watch a movie with your friend, um, and even if you like a lot of the same things, you might pick up, uh, you might see different different things when you're watching the, the, the film, right? Not different things in the sense that you are imagining things that are not there, but rather you are thinking about things having different meaning based on your experiences, right? So watch this film and sort of think about all of these factors. Um, is one right and the other one's wrong? Um, why is it that they are looking at the same society so differently? How does the historical period, um, gender, and theoretical perspective influence what they are what they are seeing? And also, is there a middle ground, ground perspective between these two? So, when we think about objectivity and morality, I want you to think about what subjectivity is means or implies, right? When we think about subjectivity, we want to say that we're um, looking from the point of view of a subject, so no, not objective, right? And when we think about science, we think of science as being objective, but in reality, Science is it's always being done by a subject, right? There are different ways in which this, this subjectivity can be sort of curbed to sort of acknowledge those biases, but at the end, everything that we know, everything that's knowledge, everything that's science is produced through subjects, through individuals that are receiving funding from a specific agencies, that are looking for specific things that went that had a specific training in a specific backgrounds, right? That that want to see specific things for a specific um, research, right? So there are all of these different factors that come in. Not to say that uh, objectivity um, is wrong or that subjectivity is wrong, but rather that we need to understand science uh, and anthropology in particular as something that is always going to be. Um, produced by a subject. So when we think about objectivity, right, this is what I was what I, what I was discussing, right? When we think about objectivity, we think about observing without interfering, detachment from the object of study, so you don't get too close, because if you get too close, then you know you're not gonna see the real the real thing that's that's happening there. And also not imposing your opinions. But in this context, right, can we really do this? Can we really observe without interfering? Can you really go to, let's say, a party um, and observe the party without you 
changing what the party is like, right? And not to get very matrix-like or anything. But the idea that you can observe something without interfering is something that we at least have to question, right? This idea of the detachment of the object of study, of course, this can be mean different things depending on what you study, right? But uh, but when you study people, the idea that you can detach yourself from the objects of study, it's complicated, right? Not imposing your opinions, that's another one that's pretty complicated, right? Because at the end of the day, we're all, some of our opinions are not even like, like we've discussed in the past, we're not even thinking about them. They're so automatic, so normal, um, they are common sense in a lot of ways. So when we think about cultural anthropology and participant observation, we have to realize that this is a subjective enterprise, right? And that all of these factors, I mean, there's this graphic, right? But all of these things are, are, are real, right? In how we experience the world. And why someone who has different, different sort of, a different identity, a different body, a different sort of perspective, they're gonna, they might experience something else. And this is not totally subjective, right? But this is because when you go to the field, people are going to look at you differently and they're also going to interact with you based on what you look like, how you speak the language, um, what clothes you're wearing, all of this stuff, right? That we don't think influence science. All of this stuff influences uh, participant observation and ethnographic research. So what are the, the, met, the, the, the limits, right, of the ethnographic method? Objectivity and morality, right? What's the, when we think about objectivity and morality, how can we be objective? Is it our role to be an uh, objective, right? And when we think about morality, how sh what should anthropologists do when they find unjust or dangerous situations, right? Should we interfere? And does that change the, the objectivity of our research, right? So Nancy Shepard Hughes, who's, who's a, a, a pretty prominent anthropologist who's still alive um, and who has a, 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 a turtle tattoo on her arm, um, she sort of started thinking about this when she was working in a favela in, in Brazil. And working in this favela, um, Nancy Shepard Hughes encountered that a lot of different, that a lot of really small children were dying because of dehydration. Their mothers had to work in, in the city, right? So they had to travel uh, often as domestic employees, uh, often in the service sector. They couldn't take their, their, their little ones to, to, to um, their work. So they had to leave them at home, sometimes alone, sometimes being taken care of by other children, right? And a lot of these children were dying because of dehydration. And there was all of this industry around uh, children dying, right? Uh, creating caskets for children was a, a big business, right? This idea of how mothers sort of thought about their, their children dying, right? A sort of um, representatives of them in, in heaven, right? So Nancy Shepard Hughes thought, what's my role here? Um, should I try to help them or should I just sort of describe them in my in my book, right? And she thought that anthropology should be a, a, a politically committed and morally engaged um, enterprise, right? Where understanding doesn't always mean accepting, right? So you can understand, but you don't necessarily have to accept the reality as it is. In fact, a lot of anthropologists are interested in sort of transforming that reality, right? In sort of showing how reality and how some of these hidden mechanisms work and then trying to transform those. So what she did is that she, she, she eventually helped uh, one, of the, one of the kids that she found and, and, um, and she interfered, right? Does that make her book or her study less valuable? Most people would say it doesn't, right? I mean, that, that depends on, on who you're talking to. But I think in a lot of ways, this is really what participant observation is about, right? Trying to sort of understand these ethical dilemmas that happens when you're doing research. <clears throat> so thinking about Nancy Shepard Hughes, I also want you to think about the, the sort of access we have in the field. So Nancy Shepard Hughes, when she first went to, to, to Brazil, she went there uh, as a Peace Corps volunteer, right? So she was in the, in the she, she had to help, that was her, her job, right? But then she came back as an anthropologist and she had all of these questions, right? Should I, should I interfere? 
um, they're asking me to interfere because I've interfered in the past, because I've helped them in the past. Uh, and that gave her a lot of, of, of access, right? But in a lot of cases, the access you have to different people when you're conducting field work depends a lot on, on your race, on your gender, on your sexuality, on your age, right? So for example, if you and, and, and if you watch this this video, um, this documentary on Margaret Mead, uh, you can see how um, age and gender sort of play a role in that, right? It's not the same if you're a a, a sixty year old uh, man, then you know you might be um, you might have access to to older men, right, and older women perhaps, um, and they might want to talk to you, but maybe you won't have um, really good access to younger people, right? And Margaret Mead, when she went to the field, she was a, a, a young woman, so she was mostly talking with other young women, right? But when Derek Freeman went to the field, he was a, 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 an older man who was basically talking to older men, right? So how does that shape uh, the ethnography? Relationships in the field are complicated, right? In a lot of cases, anthropologists can travel to a particular community and they can leave, right? If things get ugly, if there's something happening, anthropologists can often leave, but people in the community cannot, right? And this is something that we have to think about. And even if you go to the field and you find that that you really like people and, and everyone's great and you develop these really great personal relationships, there's always an unbalance, right? First of all, because you can live. Second, because in a lot of cases we are uh, studying down, right, or populations that have less resources than we do, right? So in a lot of cases we are coming from American universities and going into these other places um, that don't have the same access to resources as, as we do. And finally, there are alliances, right? And this is the, the, the article that you just read, thinking about the fugitive ethnography, right? There are alliances that are formed in the field, but these alliances have are not one-sided, right? People want to collaborate with you sometimes because they also have expectations. They also, they're also trying to see what they can get out of that situation, just like anthropologists are trying to get out information so that they can publish, finish, finish their PhDs, get a, a job at a university or whatever, right? People in the communities are also trying to see how they can advance their own um, political agendas, right? Their their own uh, their own desires of what life should be like. <clears throat> so how can anthropologists talk I mean, if we're if we are in this position of privilege, right? How can we talk about oppressed or marginalized communities? That's really the, 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 the sort of complicated part, right? And where we have to do a lot of thinking. How is it that we sort of uh, talk about this when we come from different backgrounds? How is it that we talk about this when we might face harassment and violence in the field, particularly um, female anthropologists, women who are doing uh, field work in any context? They are um, prone to, to harassment and violence in the field. Um, and also, you know, thinking about the communities that we work with, not as good or bad, but as complex communities that are trying to make the best of their own situations, right? How do we talk about them um, when sometimes they might do things that are questionable, like, like we all have done, right? We all have done things that are questionable, but we shouldn't try to talk about, I mean, most anthropologists try to don't talk about the people they work with as bad, but in a lot of cases, they'll talk about them as good, right, in a sort of romantic sense. So how can we make this picture more complex, more complicated? People are complicated. We aren't good or bad, rather we're in complex situations, uh, making a lot of mistakes, trying to figure out what's best for us. Uh, and anthropologists should also think about the people they work with with this in mind. Thank you.